Good afternoon. Welcome back. My name is Katherine Kiley, and I'm an assistant professor at Ivy Tech Community College, and I serve on the planning committee for this event. It is my pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Andrew Litherland. Aaron, I'm sorry, Aaron Litherland. I was so worried on mispronouncing his last name that I end up mispronouncing his first name. Aaron is the CEO of Clear Future Healthcare, a company which works to improve patient satisfaction and minimize healthcare costs. He began his healthcare career 14 years ago as a CNA and started his nursing career over eight years ago as a resource nurse at Indiana University Health in Bloomington, Indiana. The goal of his presentation is to show the possibilities of disruptive technology in healthcare and provide insight into near-term changes resultant from disruption technology. Don't, don't clap yet. You don't, you don't know whether you want to clap for me or not, right? Well, welcome, everyone. Uh, I love Evansville. By the way, I grew up like an hour away from here, and I had two long-term girlfriends at USI, so I was here all the time. So it's a pretty awesome town, a pretty awesome campus, and I love the fact that you guys can live in an apartment on your freshman year like on campus. That's pretty sweet. So um, I'm going to go a little bit more into my background because I think it'll make a little bit more sense on why I'm presenting the way that I'm presenting. I started Clear Future Healthcare, uh, 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 and my friend Chad back there, we, we started it because we started seeing some problems with technology just a little bit inside of healthcare. And we wanted to be innovative, but we wanted to do it in a cost-effective manner, and we wanted to solve difficult problems with simple solutions and simple technology. As we started at Clear Future Healthcare, we were invited to get Google Glass from the, uh, the person that patented most of the pro uh, stuff on glass, Vivak Parviz, we went out to San Francisco and got Google Glass. And we were just like, this is going to revolutionize everything. Now, mind you, I have a clinical background in emergency, and I didn't turn my phone down. Uh, emergency room, critical care, med surge, uh, long-term health care, or long-term living health care, uh, skilled, unit, skilled nursing unit. So, when we went out there, I didn't have this technological knowledge. Like, I just went out and was like, this is awesome. We're going to create something on this, and it's going to be great. So we did. We did create something. We did create a communication platform, but what we ended up finding out was the market was really small because a lot of people don't like to put those on, glasses on their face unless you're me. The potential is huge, though. So I did some reflection this past month or two and totally redid the way that I was going to present to you. One, because I think Brian is going to speak very well on the disruptive technologies and the future of technologies. So I didn't want to do the exact same thing with that he was doing. But the other thing was is I had to get back to why I started the company and why I got into healthcare. So that's why my presentation is the way that it is. So, so let's talk about a few facts. And I'm going to start off with the facts. At the end of this, I'm going to revisit the facts. I'm not telling you that I know the answer on why these facts that I'm going to present are the way they are and that technology caused it. But after I'm done and we revisit it, think about it. In 1999, 99,000 people died from medical errors. That's a pretty big number. So. In 1999, if I was taking care of patients, I was probably part of something that caused a medical error, 99,000 people. But what I find more staggering is in 2012, there was 400,000 medical errors that caused deaths. So I presented that to my co-founder, and I said, that's insane. We went from 99,000 to 400,000, and him being in the background of technology and gathering data, he said, but we can gather data better. So I started thinking. Okay, but does that really account for 300,000 deaths more in 2012? From those 400,000 deaths, it cost the United States and our healthcare system $1 trillion approximately. Now we're trying to get healthcare costs down. So why did it cause? Why, why are we at $1 trillion? And then 60%, and I think this is probably the most impactful number, is 60% were due to lack of communication. What people don't understand and comprehend is that 
In healthcare, everything is based upon communication. If I look inside a computer, I have to have communication. I don't care if the technology is giving me communication or you're giving me communication. We have to communicate. And when I started 14 years ago, going on 15 years ago, I used to communicate face to face and have real face time with my colleagues. Not my iPhone FaceTime, like I actually talked to a person face to face and we were like, how are we going to take care of this patient? But now it's very disconnected. So it's not like it used to be even five years ago. So what is disruptive technology? We're a little confused, I think, in society on what disruptive technology is because disruptive technology is not a bad thing. Some people, when you say disruptive technology, you think, oh, it's something that just disrupts everything. It gets in my way. Well, that thing was just in my way. I'm just going to push that out of the way. No, that's not what disruptive technology is. What disruptive technology does and what it is, here's your checklist. It displaces current technology. It doesn't replace. Who here has a cell phone? Who here has a landline? Right? So it didn't replace it, but it did displace it. So a lot of you don't have a landline, but you do have a cell phone. It creates a new market or benefits a current market. It is integrated into society. And it's affordable to the general public. And it solves a problem. It truly solves a problem. It doesn't create a problem. It doesn't make a problem that's not there all of a sudden be there. It actually solves a problem that we currently have. So some examples of disruptive technology in society. We have cell phones. And as you guys noticed, you guys, all, a lot of you have cell phones, and you're either tweeting out how awesome I am or how awful I am, or texting because you're so bored. So stop texting. And then we have tablets. That revolutionized the way that we do things. It's mobile. We move. We can now take all our information on a tablet and walk around everywhere. But in the mid-'80s, early-'80s, maybe I'm getting my dates wrong, a computer was in a warehouse that cost millions of dollars. And they're like, we're going to bring it to your desk. That is not mine. Ed, we are going to bring it to your desktop. And now we brought it to your desktop. And people were like, that's never going to happen. And then we're like, now we've got to carry it. So now we have a laptop. And then all of a sudden, we became a tablet. And we carry a tablet everywhere. Now we have a phone, and we carry our phone everywhere with us. That's how disruptive technology works. Microwaves, anybody here alive? or remember without a microwave, right? So a few of you remember, but I bet you don't remember what it was really, really, really like because microwaves have been so integrated in our society, it's hard to remember what it was like, right? And that's what disruptive technology does. We have television, cars, and electricity, and some where randomly why I thought of this was Keurig. And the reason I thought of this actually was I was drinking coffee after I made coffee and I was like, wow, that's, it's so simple. I didn't have to like, make a pot of coffee. And so it's so interesting to me. Keurig is actually a very disruptive technology, but we don't think about it. It's introduced in our life. We buy it because it's convenient and it's cost effective. And yes, the Keurig cups cost a little bit more, but we're willing to pay that sacrifice for a cup of coffee, right? So disruptive technology is inside of healthcare. X-rays, MRIs, CTs, I don't think anyone can, can uh, deny that those have been, uh, have been exponential in, in the way that we take care of our patients and have been a, a huge influence. And we can't deny that those are disruptive technologies. And computers are integrated inside of healthcare. And as we keep going, we're starting to see tablets, but they're not really widely adopted. And then we have virtual desktop infrastructure. You guys may use that here at the university. They do use it at IU, and it's starting to become a lot more popular. It's pretty much taking your computer everywhere you go. So your desktop is with you everywhere, and you can print anywhere at any time, and you can do whatever you want on a phone, a tablet, or on your own computer. Telemedicine, medication scanners, which has, it's insane. I would never give a med without a medication scanner unless we have a downtime now. And yet when we went to medication scanning, I was like, this is stupid. Why would I do this? And now I would not do it any other way. And then cloud computing, which you guys use in society now, is starting to slowly get into the healthcare system. 
So other disruptive technologies, other future disruptive technologies in healthcare, or emerging technologies, or the wave of the future, are Google Glass. If you had been to a presentation of mine before, I would have told you that I believed Google Glass um, is a disruptive technology. Now, do I believe it disrupts things? Absolutely. Is it affordable? Do you have $1,500 a pop for them to test it? Is it integrated in society? No. So to me, that's not a disruptive uh, technology yet. The myo armband and the leap motion, if you guys have been out there and saw those technologies, they do have a lot of promise and a lot of future, but are they disruptive in our society yet? No. Because half of you were just, well, actually all of you that came to my booth said, what is this? I would assume that if it was a disruptive technology, you would know what it is. Leap motion and virtual reality. The interesting thing about virtual reality is that in 1991, it was the wave of the future. It was amazing. And like my parents would take me to the mall, and I would be up there at the mall, and I would be like, all right, I want to go to the arcade, and they have virtual reality, so I'd put it on my head, and, I, and I'd pay like a gazillion dollars, I think, just to like be in virtual reality and then simulations. But then it didn't go anywhere. I'd go to Toys R Us and see the virtual boy and thought I was just like the coolest kid for having one of those. But it didn't go anywhere until a couple years ago when somebody really solved the problem of virtual reality, which it wasn't very mobile. So now you see Oculus Rift and these new virtual reality toys that I had, the little one I had outside. So that is something in the near future, and that will be coming to market soon. So disruptive technology and communication in healthcare. See, this is where I think it starts getting really important because I focused on communication. Because of 400,000 of, uh, 400, of your deaths because of medical errors happen a year in the United States, and 60% of them is because of communication. I think that's kind of something that needs to be focused on. So the electronic medical record is one way that we currently uh, communicate inside of healthcare. Electronic medical record is set in your, uh, it's a computer that you have a software and you input your data on a patient and then people look at the data and that's how you take care of your patient and that's how we document now. And it's government mandated to have pretty much everybody on a, an EMR or an electronic medical record system. And it's important that you guys understand what, what the government is saying that you have to do with your electronic medical records. It, it hasn't been as important as it has been in the past couple of years that new nurses understand that and people in healthcare understand that. At a very high level, of course. We have pagers, we have email, we have voice. These have been widely adopted. I use a phone, I call a doctor. I page the doctor, right? Now we do have telemedicine, which hasn't, has not been widely adopted, and we can agree to disagree on that one, but I will tell you that telestroke's great, and evaluating psych patients are great, and that has been adopted, but I don't think it's been adopted widely as, as, as a lot of us may perceive it has been. Bidirectional texting, that hasn't been widely adopted. Imagine your data plan, multiply that by 10, and then put it to everybody in the hospital. That's a lot of money. Technology is expensive. Bidirectional texting isn't just simple. You don't just throw it in to healthcare. We can argue about the nuances of HIPAA and all that stuff all day long, but the truth of the matter is, bottom line, it's really expensive right now unless you're innovative and can find a way around that expensive solution. And tablets. I've been begging for tablets ever since we've had tablets around, uh, or at least had access to the first iPad. But it hasn't been widely adopted. So if you have tablets, tablets at your uh, bedside, then great for you. But not a lot of us do. Electronic medical records, let's talk about some things, uh, some facts about electronic medical records. They're used at the majority of healthcare systems, right? You have to run on it, and I said that earlier. But users claim that many EMRs have poor interfaces. I'll tell you, when I look at a lot of EMRs, and when I'm teaching EMRs, because by the way, I'm a clinical informatics educator, so I teach the electronic medical records, and I told some of you, have you ever sat in that computer class that's really boring that teaches you how to chart on patients, and you get really bored with it? That's me, I'm the one that teaches that. So users claim that they have poor interface. And when I look at it, I go, man, are we on Windows 95 or, or what? What are, we, what are we charting on here? You know, only to come, out, come to find out that a lot of vendors have bought from other, other places like in the 90s and bought these EMR systems and never really have updated them. 
So they're not used to the, we're not used to the interface. We can pick out our phone. We can understand our phone. We can use a tablet, and we understand the tablet. We, can, we get on the computer, and we can navigate. We get into an EMR, and we're like, what is this? Why is it not as easy as Facebook? And I guess I should move on, because Facebook isn't cool anymore. So Twitter, Instagram, Vine, whatever. So it's hard to pull data into one central location. See, we used to be the gatekeeper of information. As a nurse, as a physician, as ancillary departments, we knew what was going on with the patient, and we were able to talk to each other. And now, when we implemented this technology, we can't extract that data. As e or we can extract it easily, but we can't present it well. It's not presentable. We can. I mean, ask Brian. He knows how to, how to do that. But for, but for example, you know, any electronic medical record that I've used, I just can't find what I need at the time that I need it. And sharing information with others seems really difficult. Um, my director of pharmacy was in here, uh, and he used to be my director, and so I'm glad he's not here because I'll share a story. At the hospital, a lot of times with pharmacy, we would call down and we would be like, you did not put, you did not put the order in correctly, or I don't see the order. Why haven't you put it in? And the pharmacy says, I put in the order, I see it. I'm like, no, but you didn't. And they're like, but I did. And then I went to informatics, and I was like, what does pharmacy look like? I go over, and I look in their screen. I, I look at their screen, and I'm like, oh, my gosh. Their screen is completely different than my screen. So, of course, we're never going to be able to communicate because we're looking at two different systems. They're not talking to each other. And as a nurse, I don't really care. I just want you to put in my orders. But the truth of the matter is, is it's really important. It's really important. It delays cares. If I have a patient laying on the bed dying of terminal cancer and bone meds, and it takes me three hours to get my medication because your system doesn't talk to my system, that's a problem. And it happens. Poor backup plans for downtime. If I would go five years ago to downtime, 75% of the nurses would be like, this is awesome. We are going back to paper. Now I look at it. And it's gone to like 75% of nurses are like, what do we do? And 25% of nurses are like, I love being on paper, except for the fact that 75% of you are asking me what we do. So it's just a mess. It's a mess because, I mean, technology has been integrated into our lives so much that we go into this job and we start working under technology. And then the rarity that we have to use paper, we're like, what do we do? Remember, you have a patient. You don't have to rely on technology. There is basic care that you can do. But you know, whenever I used paper, I thought my biggest problem was the fact that my pen didn't work. I'd have to throw out and get a new one. Or maybe I lost my paper, don't tell anyone, and I'd run and go find it and bring it back. That seemed to be the biggest problems. Now what used to take me 10 minutes seems to take me about 5 million hours to do. So you can only imagine the frustrations as a nurse whenever you know what it could be like and what it should be like. And this is why I encourage nursing to start looking at HIT to make a difference for patients. And we need reliable devices and networks. And that's the other thing that people don't understand is that EMR systems don't just go down because they're awful. Sometimes your network's awful. Sometimes a lot of things that are running in the background are awful. So that is one of the major, uh, major concerns and major misconceptions uh, with EMRs when they go down, or misperceptions, conceptions. Huh. Um, so it creates a barrier between patients and staff. You know, I would love to just say that that is just not a true statement, but I've heard from staff and I've heard from patients time and time again, why are you behind this computer? Why are you not helping me? What are you doing? And I have to show them what I'm doing. And so for me, it's kind of disheartening. And so what, what do people do, nurses do? They just create a workaround. They're like, I'm not going to chart at the bedside because I don't want that barrier, so I'm going to do everything, write it down, and then I'm going to put it on paper. Okay, so now we just did the old process and we did the new process. That makes a lot of sense. So data. I made this very simple. Data is easy to collect, and without pulling it out and showing it properly to staff, it's hard to analyze. And what I find is that we have to go out and find a product to pull off the data to make it look better so we can make the decisions that we need to make 
because it's not in the product that we currently own because the one that we own didn't do a good job of it. And it's extremely important that the data is correct and that it's there when we need it. Because if you've ever been in a code situation or a rapid response or someone's going downhill and you can't find the information that you need to find and the time that you need to find it, it's a problem. And nobody knows what to do, so you're just like, ah, just start compressions. Oh, well, we'll just do this. Oh, well, let's do this. Let's follow the protocol. Wait, their potassium's too high. I found it. Who, go, who gets what information? It's, it's back to the pharmacy, the, the situation with the pharmacy. Who gets what information? Who has what information? What does the nurse know? What does the tech know? What does environmental services do? What does, um, what does the UC do? What, what does the unit coordinator do? What does the, pharm the pharmacist do? What does the doctor do? What do they know? Do they have everything? I've got different access and so-and-so. So now we're all just in this big cluster of just information everywhere, but it's not being shared. And we wonder why readmission rates come back so high. So the future of disruptive technologies. Wearables, huge, huge. I believe things have to be integrated in society before you can bring it into healthcare. I, that's what I've learned over this past year is you can't throw in things that just haven't even been proven to work into society and then think that healthcare is going to accept it. So wearables are big. So we were looking at Fitbits and smartwatches and all kinds of awesomeness that I just can't afford all of that. But there's all kinds of wearables. But you know what? If you wear a Fitbit and you move to a Samsung um, gear, you're probably not going to be able to get the data from the Fitbit to the Samsung platform. If you can't figure it out in society, why do we think it's going to actually work in healthcare yet? Virtual reality. Wearables, to me, is what virtual reality was in 91. Do I think that it's going to take 25 years for it to become a viable product? Absolutely not, because the way that technology works, Things are moving faster and faster and faster. So fast, we can't breathe, and we're so stressed out over it. And that is the truth. So virtual reality is a future. It's a way that we could train people. It's the way that we could simulate. It's the way that we could have somebody that lived in California to be at the bedside with their mother when they can't make it there and have a conversation. It's a way that we could do wellness checks inside of homes. So there are possibilities for virtual reality. Do not dismiss these uh, future technologies. Body sensors. Third world countries use body sensors. Four dollars, slap it on somebody, and you got their vital signs all the time. But guess what? For some reason, we've yet to adopt that. We don't adopt these disruptive technologies or these future disruptive technologies. And in some places, they're beneficial. But right now, society just hasn't accepted it. The leap motion and using hands free in that myo armband that I showed you. The armband that takes myoelectrical activity and all your gestures, you can control things. And if I was so cool, I would have this all set up where I could dim the lights. I would have had a fog machine. I would have lasers coming out with my, with my myo armband and ran out of here. I don't know if that made me cooler, but it would have been an awesome entrance. But that's what myo armbands can do. They can really control things around you and how you can control the environment without having to, uh, them doing things hands-free. And there are some some pretty good cases inside of, of healthcare um, where these things are actually being utilized. But once again, it's not adopted in society, so that's why it, I believe it's not widely adopted inside of healthcare. So where do we go from here? Where, where do we need to end up? Sorry, I'm looking at time. You don't have a clock in here, guys. So where will we go from here? And what do I envision? Well, I think we need to consider the options to optimize our disruptive technologies that we currently have. We're moving way too fast, kind of like me speaking. I'm a little fast. We move way too fast, and we need to optimize our disruptive technology. Because what's the point in bringing in another technology when I don't even understand the one that I currently have? I understand that these new technologies are very lucrative. They are a very lucrative business. But you know what? The patient always comes first. And if you follow that, you're always going to get your reimbursement back. You're always going to get your investment back. And so when we realize that as healthcare, I think we'll become 
uh, financially viable. So developing a national standard to prove technologies are effective. And the tools improve patient care. So pharma pharmaceutical companies spend 10 years or more researching a product. They finally get it approved. And then all of a sudden, there's claims that it caused bladder cancer, when really there's only been six court cases on it or whatever. They have to take it back and have to research it, and it's, it's a big problem. But as we use technology in small doses everywhere while we test it on people, there are some regulations. But the truth of the matter is, I couldn't tell you what my standard regulation is on trialing something. And you don't understand the repercussions of what you do with technology until it's almost too late. See, I thought that a product that we currently have rights to and that we're utilizing for, for patients, when it was initially built, it was thought that it was a, visualization, it was a, it was a, a data visualization, visualization tool that you could look at specific uh, you could look at specific systems such as cardiology, infectious disease, neurological, and you can see the basic data that we pulled out of the EMR. What we found was when we built something, an electronic medical record, and we didn't tell the person that built that visualization input or that data that's presented, we didn't tell them that we built this piece, and that information wasn't flowing over. So let's say that we built a piece of, um, of, of something in the EMR, let's say we built a new INO. And in our intake and outtake, let's say we put in chest tubes. For cardiology, that's huge. But let's say, for instance, we didn't tell the person that programmed that data, or the data visualization, that we built those chest tube outputs in there. So now, what's the doctor doing? Looking at INOs, keeping the chest tube in, not much coming out, or taking it out because there's not much coming out. And I go, oh, everything's great. Oh, yeah, one slight problem. You actually didn't get any of the data from the chest tubes. So that's what I find as well. It was very convenient on rolling it out. If you miss something as simple as that, it can ruin everything. And that's communication. It's communication. It doesn't matter. It's still technology communicating. It's still you inputting data and somebody else viewing it. Understand the difference between disruptive technology and what is the wave of the future. I actually was presenting this um, to a friend of mine, and he said, why would you even put that bullet point in there? Does that, why, that doesn't make any sense. It actually makes complete sense to me, at least. right? I hope it makes sense to you, because you need to know what disruptive technology is and understand what the wave of the future or emerging technology or exp exponential technology is. You, you need to know what's coming because that's the wave of the future. That's the emerging technology. But you need to know what we have right now. And it is amazing to me that I cannot get a phone on the side of my scrubs. I cannot get a tablet. But by God, I thought I could just bring in Google Glass. Give me a break. If, if in society, everybody's like, oh my gosh, I can, you're, you're taping me. What? What do you think patients are going to think? Now, there are plenty, there are plenty of companies out there that are doing it. And as I said, it's a niche market, and they've got the market. But it's not a mass market. And so my concern is, is that we're adopting these technologies that are brand new without even testing it to see if anybody even likes it or even if it solves a problem. I've even questioned when we built that communication system inside of Google Glass for telemedicine, for emergency medicine and EMTs, Going into an ER, I even questioned myself on, was that really a problem? I mean, one could argue that that's really not where the problem or the patients are dying. And statistics show that patients really aren't dying because of the lack of communication en route to the hospital. So were we causing more distraction um, while we were trying to communicate? I, I don't know. Uh, where I, and I told a few of you guys this, where I visualized that working out very well would be in the emergency room, and I'm giving a report to the third floor, a med surge unit, and I'm saying, let's do an assessment together, and I'm wearing my Google Glass, and they're looking on their screen, and we're doing an assessment together, 
and I can say, yes, that patient's appropriate for this floor. I don't feel comfortable taking this patient yet. Because communication handoff is one of the biggest reasons for medical errors. Use our technologies, as I said, to improve communication. I can't harp on that enough. Communication is huge. If communication wasn't huge in technology, you would not be here in this conference. I am sharing my knowledge to you. I'm communicating to you. I'm letting you know that communication is huge in healthcare. And lastly, and this is the most important thing in the next five years, I believe. Move over, passive patient. Patients have a voice. They need to be engaged. We need to consider how the technologies are going to affect patients and how can the patients use that technology. We did something at IU Health Bloomington, which I presented out there. We did a project where we, we were on a PEDS, uh, we, we piloted on a PEDS floor, but as a patient engagement project. And, and what we wanted to prove, one thing was that we could engage patients at a very cost-effective manner, pretty much at no cost, actually, except for what it took, the hours it took to build it. And we had three simple buttons on this iPad. And the three buttons were my day, my, how oh, was my caregivers, and uh, my info. Three buttons. And so you hit the one button on my day, and you got to see medications, labs, rads, uh, nursing, and surgery scheduled out. And then inside of that, we were able to pull out their medications, and we attached it to the education that we would normally print out to them, with the goal being that we save the clinician's time. I'm just going to be completely blunt and honest with you. I don't build things or I don't work on things to make the lives of our clinicians easier. It just happens to be a byproduct of what we build because the patient is the end goal, and making your life easier makes sure that the patient's safer. So we built this for the patient. And there was just kind of an uproar a little bit, not a little bit, there was a lot of people that were kind of like, wow, we're letting them know what's going on, and oh my gosh, why would we let them know what's going on? Well, they used these tablets, and the parents would use it, and the only frustrating thing for them was they didn't have enough information. They were like, we want more. We want more. And that's where the fine line of patient engagement is, is where do you start and where do you stop? Where do you start increasing anxiety by giving them too much information? But that is my experience with patient engagement, and as we move forward, we're looking at taking that product, in, or taking a product similar to that concept and making it uh, move beyond just at the bedside, but making it be a continuity of care, and, and that we're going into the doctor's office and we can see what's going on um, at the doctor's office, and then when they go, we actually have true health information exchange. So revisiting the facts, after everything that I've stated, after all my observations, in this past year, in the past 14 years, really. We go back to 1999, 99,000 people died from medical errors. In 2012, over 400,000 people died from medical errors. And that cost the US $1 trillion. And 60% of it was due to lack of communication. If you tell me that technology has no role in that, you're lying to yourself. Do I think it caused all that? No, because there's been huge benefits from technology, but it hasn't been optimized and used appropriately yet. So to me, I think those are valid numbers. I think those are valid concerns to have. So this is my last slide, and only I put it up for a few reasons. One, because it's really, really awesome, because I have my baby with me. Um, he's not that little anymore. He's 18 months, and I would never be able to get another picture like this. It just once and it just happened, right? So I, this is after I just got Google Glass, and he was like, oh, Daddy, that's awesome. I'm so glad you got Glass. Was it really? He doesn't talk. Look how little he is. He doesn't talk. But I, you know, so I bought, a, I bought actually another pair of Glass. I, I uh, got a hold of Babak, Babak and asked him if I could get another pair. And so we both had this pair of glass, and I, I put this slide up because I think it's really relevant to what I'm talking about when it comes to the future of technologies. And why I do this in healthcare, and why I have chosen to stay with technology, not go back to the bedside. One, this represents to me the future of healthcare, or technology, I should say. 
He is the one going to grow up with this technology. He is the one that's going to have it integrated in his life. He is the one that's going to, he is what you guys are now with cell phones and Twitter and Instagram and Vine and, and those things will pass and you'll get older, I promise. And you'll get older and you will be that old person and you'll go, oh my gosh, man, I'm not cool anymore. And then he's going to be coming around wearing a pair of Google Glass and be like, I just don't get it. I just don't get it. He gets it. He's going to get it. So he is the future of the, the technologies that I've spoken about. But the other thing is, is he's the future of healthcare in some form or fashion. And I refuse to allow healthcare or technology prevent my son, when he gets older, to get bad care. I refuse to let my family go into a place where technology has caused so much disruption in a bad way that we are not taking care of the patient. So for me, that's why I stick into, into technology. And I, need, and I need and I want to put an indelible dent inside of healthcare. So if I can summarize everything and anything that you can take away from this, I want you to focus on this. Utilize and understand the current technologies that we have. Figure out the problems, find a solution with the current technologies that are available and that are accepted in society and that are easy, easily adaptable. Don't forget about future technologies coming in because they will be here. But do not put the cart before the horse. So I'm open for questions or comments. And I know that this may have raised some people frustration or it may have been like, you got it or neither in between. Any questions? I know it's 2 o'clock or oh, 2.35. So you guys know everything about technology, and you guys are great and good to go? Yes? You know, I, I ha I've never, I've, I've, I've personally never, ever got to use one or see one. I've only got to talk to people that have done, example, mission trips or done certain things, and, and so... That's, that's how I even know about the body sensors being used. Because they'll come back and be like, why aren't we using this? Nice. But yeah, right? Right. It would be amazing. It would be amazing. Okay. I'm not going to push you to ask questions. All right. Well, thank you guys very much. Have a great day.